Um, for those who don't know me, I'm Rory Fitzgerald, the principal, and we get the, together tonight, uh, albeit virtual, but this is a very important um, presentation that we give. And uh, for those of you who came last year, uh, I think you'll be we concur that uh, Ms. Murphy knows a lot about uh, financial aid and is very helpful. And um, I'm sure it's a twist this year due, due to the times we're in. And uh, uh, we all hope everyone is, is healthy and safe. Uh, it was great to see a lot of people last night at the at the um, pep rally slash senior presentation awards night. Um, senior, so I um, just want to introduce uh, Ms. Murphy uh, and give you a little bio about her. Uh, she began her financial aid career over, over 39 years ago. Um, she has a variety of experience involving four-year public and independent colleges, vocational technical schools, and multiple campus proprietary colleges. She owned and supervised an educational management consulting company providing post-secondary institutions with expertise in various financial aid areas. From that experience, Catherine became the compliance officer at Montclair State University, She's been an active member of the NJASFAA since the late 80s. She served as president and continues to be involved in numerous committees. Um, as I said before, she did a great job last year. This, this presentation will, um, we shared with you the PowerPoint. We put a lot of, I also sent home a lot of documents that about financial aid she shared with us. Uh, there'll be time for questions. Um, and she's uh, really laid back in terms of, of uh, answering a lot of questions. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Catherine Bosher Murphy. Thank you. Thank you, Rory. And thank you everybody for coming. Um, I, I'm sorry we can't do this in person, but this may be better out, better off for everybody because you can have dinner and listen to me. So you can accomplish two things at once. If you could put your, um, Speakers on mute, just so there's no feedback for um, the participants. And I am attempting to record this. So if it works, then I would send that up to uh, the school and then um, Mr. Fitzgerald could post that on the website. Um, I will stop for questions throughout. So we use the chat function. If you have um, your Zoom screen on your computer, then chat is at the bottom and all you have to do is click on that and then you can type in your question and I'll break several times to do that. Um, right now I'm going to access the presentation. So this is what you're going to um, follow along with. And again, this is available um, on the website, I believe. So as Rory said, I'm Associate Director in Charge of Compliance at Montclair State. I've been in aid for 39 years. I've been at Montclair for, I'm going into my seventh year. Um, it's a lovely institution. And I know somebody mentioned their child wants to come and take a look. Um, and we'd love to have anybody who's interested come visit. Although right now it's still virtual. This presentation is sponsored by New Jersey HESA. HESA is the state agency that processes um, the state grant funds and most uh, Students are aware of the New Jersey TAG grant, tuition aid grant, and their mission is to help students and families with the financial aid and informational resources to be able to um, enroll and pursue their education beyond the high school level. Um, I'll throw up their website um, towards the end of the presentation. They have a lot of excellent material that is available for students and families. So tonight we're gonna to talk about these topics. Um, everybody's interested in financial aid. We'll define what that is. We will talk about the application process, forms and deadlines. We'll um, go over how the eligibility is determined, what does a FAFSA do? And then talk about the packaging, um, comparing offers, and then some other issues when we get to the end. Feel free to ask any question in the chat. Um, if I know I'm going to cover it later, I may put it off for the moment, but I will not ignore it. So within the financial aid office, our role is to help students with paying for their college education if they and their family are unable to do so themselves. And the way we do this is by assessing the family's ability to pay based on the results of the FAFSA and the federal formula. 
We are also tasked with distributing limited resources in as fair and equitable a manner as we can. We try to um, combine different um, sources of financial aid. So students have gift aid um, or grants and self-help, which would be loans and work. And we are also responsible for making sure that federal, state, and institutional regulations are met when we are processing um, student files. So what is financial aid? Financial aid basically um, incorporates anything that is available to the student that does not come out of the family's pocket or checkbook. And this includes grants, scholarships, student employment, and loans. Grants are considered gift aid. This is, the, this is the financial aid everybody wants because it does not have to be paid back. And typically grants are based on the need of the student, which is um, calculated based on the FAFSA. Scholarships are also considered gift aid. They also do not have to be repaid um, by the student, but there usually is a requirement component for a scholarship. Either the student has um, displayed academic achievement in high school, and then they are um, screened accordingly and given scholarship funds to help them through college, or they are um, athletic. Students may also receive scholarships based on other um, measures. So for example, if a student has AP courses they've completed with high scores, SAT scores some colleges look at, it could be because a student is very good in music. But these scholarships, um, not only are they based on a skill or a talent, they often require um, a minimum uh, requirement for renewal. So for example, if you are on an athletic scholarship and um, your child quits the team, they would no longer be eligible for that. Student employment is typically offered by the colleges. Um, various colleges have different kinds of employment programs. Um, most colleges across the country participate in the federal work study program, which is uh, funded through the federal government. Um, and a lot of schools have their own student employment programs. So this is typically a part-time job on campus and the student can work when they're not in class and they are paid for hours that they work regardless of what the offer might have been on the award package. Um, most schools will not apply student employment wages towards the college bill because there's no guarantee the student will get a job. And then once a job is obtained, there is no guarantee the student will actually go to the job and work. And finally, we're talking about loans. This is the stuff that nobody wants but it is considered financial aid depending on the source. Um, these are borrowed funds that have to be repaid once the student graduates or leaves school. And there are three types. There are student loans, parent loans, and private loans. <clears throat> the interest rates and repayment plans differ by program and we encourage families to borrow wisely so that they are not over borrowing, whether that be the student or the, um, the family of the student. So there are four types of financial aid and now there are four sources of financial aid. You can have a student receive financial aid from the federal government, from the state of New Jersey, from the institution of, of higher education itself, and also from outside organizations. And that could include any type of civic organization it could include parents' employer. Oftentimes, um, where your parent works, um, they may have a scholarship program or a grant program or even a low interest loan program. The high schools often are a source of outside scholarship information through the guidance office. So for example, Tony's Pizza Parlor down the street has $200 that he wants to award to a high school student. And so he has a scholarship application and um, the student has to fill that out. And then there are private sources for scholarships, which could include things like um, Coca-Cola or the Microsoft or some of the big companies that have um, funding to help students through school. Typically for an outside scholarship, there is a separate application the student has to complete. 
those deadlines tend to be um, early spring. So now is the time to start asking questions and looking for those sources. So Catherine, who is excuse me, uh, sure. Catherine, yep. sorry, sorry to interrupt. Um, someone is still not muted. Uh, it, I think you could, Catherine, you could, as a host, you can uh, mute all, but if, if, uh, if everyone out there can make sure you're, you're muted because um, we'll I might be able to mute noise. all if I could figure that out. <laughs> you should be able to. You look at participants, um, it's, up, it's up there, so you say mute all. If not, you can make me the host and I can do it. Participants, I get invite, I don't get mute all. Wait a minute. Okay, hold on. Mute all. There we go. Okay. We're constantly learning. So I'm going to break for questions in another little minute. I don't know that we have any yet. This is a conversation about muting. Okay. So when we're talking about eligibility, we are now talking about the student. So the student has to be a US citizen or a legal resident. And there is an exception in New Jersey, which we'll talk about in a little bit. The student has to have completed or will be completing their high school diploma or GED. They have to have a valid social security number. And if they are male, they must be registered with selective service once they turn 18. In addition, the student has to be enrolled in an eligible program. And at the over 6,000 schools that participate in financial aid, most of them have a degree or certificate program, at least one that is an eligible program. And for a New Jersey student, in order to be eligible for New Jersey funds, the student um, must be a resident of New Jersey for the 12 months before classes start um, as their college freshman year. And the parents also have to be residents of New Jersey for the same period of time. Now, in order to apply for financial aid, the major form is the FAFSA. It's the Free Application for Federal Student Aid. It is free. It does not cost anything. It is required in order for over 6,000 schools to determine aid eligibility. And I will advise you that you should not pay anybody to complete the FAFSA. It is um, much easier than it used to be back in the old days when it was on a paper form. And there is a lot of um, built-in skip logic on the uh, FAFSA on the web that takes the student through questions and may skip questions if it does not apply. So it's much easier to navigate the FAFSA now than it was even five years ago. The state of New Jersey no longer has additional questions, but they may ask for documents, which we'll talk about when we get farther into the presentation. So when the student finishes the FAFSA, that information goes directly to the state of New Jersey. There are about 400 schools across the country that also require the CSS um, profile from College Board. And the reason for this is because they have huge, huge foundation um, programs where they have millions and millions and millions of scholarship dollars. And the FAFSA is restricted to the questions um, that are set by Congress every year. So colleges need to find out more about their families when they're awarding their institutional funding. And so they may require the profile. There are some schools that might still use their own institutional forms or more likely if the student's applying for a special program like an honors program or um, an internship program, there may be a separate application for that from the college. But in general, if you fill out the FAFSA, you've got yourself covered for all of the 6,000 schools that participate in um, federal financial aid. The time to apply for FAFSA is now. Um, the FAFSA for the 21-22 year opened today. You can fill out the application online anytime because it's available 24-7. Uh, the thing that you need to be aware of is that there are priority deadlines at each college. And the priority deadline is set so that it encourages students to file their FAFSAs early, but it also gives the college the ability to say, based on this date, I will consider the student for every form of aid possible. But after this date, we run out of funds. And that tends to happen at most schools. 
So the goal is to make sure that you file the FAFSA to meet the earliest deadline. If you have six schools, you should check the priority deadline date for each of those schools. And as long as you shoot for the first one, then you've got everybody else covered. Uh, for example, Montclair's priority deadline is February 1st. And I believe NJIT's is um, late December, early January. So if your student's applying to both of those colleges, fill out the FAFSA to meet New Jersey, I, uh, New, NJIT's um, priority deadline and you'll have everybody covered. New Jersey HESA and New Jersey FAMS are actually the same entity. So New Jersey HESA is the name of the agency. It's the Higher Education Student Assistance Authority and their portal for information is called New Jersey FAMS. When a student fills out the FAFSA, the information goes to HESA and then the results of that are available to the student on the FAMS website. When we, um, if you have an applicant for aid who is applying for um, New Jersey Stars or the Gus Scholarship, or if they are a Dreamer or DACA student, they can um, access the New Jersey system through hesa.org. Ultimately, you're, every student's gonna end up with a profile on, FAM and, on FAMS, and that's the important point. CSS profile, as I said, that's the website for them. Um, again, you would not fill out a profile for about 5,500 colleges, but there are roughly 400 that do require it. There is a fee involved and uh, it's $25 for the first school. And then if you have two or three schools that require profile, when you access the system, you fill out questions for all three schools without knowing which question was asked by which institution. And um, there's an additional fee for six, of $16 for each, the second and the third and the fourth college. Typically, when a college requires profile, they only want that the first year to determine funding from their own uh, foundations and scholarships. The FAFSA, you will file every year if you're making that decision to do so to receive for your son or daughter to receive financial aid. Now, are there any questions that I can answer before we move on? Let's see. Okay, no questions so far. Easy, this is the easy part. Okay, now these are the front pages of all of the websites. So this is the FAFSA page, they change it every year. So if you have an older child that you filled this out um, with last year, it'll look a little different. Um, they're migrating everything to studentaid.gov, but you can still get to the FAFSA by typing in fafsa.gov. This is the profile page, and it tells you um, it, on this website, you may find the list of schools that require profile, so you might want to check that here before you apply, and then how to apply. And then this is what the front page of the HESA website looks like for students. And um, if you're a Dreamer student, um, undocumented, or a DACA student, this is where the student would go to fill out the New Jersey version of the FAFSA. And I'll talk about that a little more um, uh, later on. In order to file the FAFSA, the student and one parent have to each have an FSA ID. So you can do that on this website here, fsaid.ed.gov, or you can do it as part of the FAFSA filing. Um, it doesn't matter per se, but it is a process where you are setting up a login password. The student sets one up for themselves so that they can go into the FAFSA every year. And they can also access other federal websites with specific information related to their login and password so they could see their, their borrowing history, their grant history over the course of their four years. A parent needs to have a login and password. Basically the um, FSA ID becomes your electronic signature. And I will recommend what we're never supposed to tell people with computers, write it down somewhere because you're not gonna remember a year from now and it's almost impossible to get a reset. So my advice is establish an FSA ID, jot it down somewhere in your important papers and keep it so that you and your 
student can get in every year to do the same, to do the FAFSA. Also, you do have to have a separate email from your student. And the student should never use their high school email address because once they graduate high school, that email goes away. So if you have a Gmail account and the student does not, then my recommendation is to set up a new Gmail account or a Juno or a Yahoo, whatever free email you can get because the student needs to have their own email address for the ID. When you're ready to go to the FAFSA, you go to that first page and then you apply for aid <clears throat> and it will take you directly to the application. This is a joint effort. You and your, your students should sit down together and you should do it when everybody's um, in a decent mood because it's just angst producing just in and of itself. So I would not do this if you're fighting with your child. <clears throat> um, you do need each other, they need you, they still need you. So it's something that you want to do um, together. When you initially enter the FAFSA, the first several screens and the first sets of questions will be student questions. And I say that because we sometimes get information about the parents' income on the student side, as well as on the parent side, and that can significantly inflate the results of the formula. So the student's going to provide their name, their given name on their social security card, their social security number. If they don't have it memorized, please pull it out of your good paperwork and the date of birth. If the student has a driver's license, they should um, provide that. And every student has to indicate the gender that they were born under, not necessarily their identity preference right now. Then the FAFSA will flip over and start to ask income and asset information for the student. And we're talking about for the 21-22 year for next September, we're talking about 2019 tax information. So your student may not have worked at all. And if they did work, they probably didn't file a tax return. Um, but if they made any kind of money from a job, part-time job, they should list their income earned from work. Then the next section is determining whether the student is an independent or dependent. And there are several reasons a student would be independent, including if they are a veteran of the armed forces, if they are married, um, if they have children of their own that they are supporting. But for all intents and purposes, we're just going to assume that everybody here is a dependent student between the ages of 18 and 24. All right, I see a couple of chats. So let's see what kind of questions we have. It's not coming up. Where'd my chat go? Let me pause the share. Okay, here we go. So if a parent has filed a FAFSA for their own schooling, should there be an additional login as the parent for the student's application? No, you can, if you have an FSA ID, uh, login and password, you will use the same one. And you will use the same one for your older child who's in college, as well as your younger child. You don't need a separate login for each child. They each need their own login, but you can use the same one. And is it clear on the form? Um, actually, yes, if you're looking. <clears throat> so at the top of the FAFSA page, in the left-hand top corner, there's a little banner that says student information, student information, and then it will switch over to parent information. So it can be um, obvious, but you have to be aware that it's up in the left corner and you have to be looking for it. Good questions. Okay. Now, once you get through the student information and the um, uh, dependency status questions, then it will switch and that little banner will change in the corner and it will start to ask parents information. <clears throat> At least one parent has to list their social security number, their last name and the date of birth. Um, we need to know the household size and the number in college. And we'll talk about that in a little more detail. The number in college is going to always be at least one. That's the student that we're filling the FAFSA out um, on their behalf or with them. 
but you may have more than one in college if you, if you have um, older brothers and sisters uh, of the student that are already in school. We then are going to collect parents' income and assets. And there, it, it took us 40 years of conversations. It took financial aid and the national organization 40 years of conversation with IRS, but there is now a way that when you get to the questions about income, you can actually go to the IRS websites and pull your income information back into the um, FAFSA without having to key the numbers in yourself. We'll talk about that a little more. Um, so anybody who filed a joint return or married, um, uh, single or head of household tax return in 2019 should be able to access the data retrieval tool. And we recommend that if you can access it, you use it um, because it can eliminate paperwork later. Income earned from work needs to be indicated because we look at adjusted gross income, but then we also look at the split and there is an allowance when there are two wage earners in the, on the parents there is um, an allowance which protects some of the income because the second parent is working. If the parent or one of the parents is a dislocated worker, you would indicate that. Then we're going to ask about whether anybody in the family is receiving any of the federal means tested benefits program. So that's um, a social security disability, SNAP, free or reduced uh, price lunch, uh, TANF or social services or WIC. And the reason that we ask that question is because there is um, a slight variation in the formula that is used to calculate eligibility based on the answer to these questions, which is beneficial to the family. I will tell you that you need to be honest about this. So if you indicate that somebody in the family um, is receiving a free or reduced price lunch, the college certainly can ask for you to prove that. And then at the end, there are, um, with the signature page, there is a place to put up to 10 schools on the FAFSA. And you indicate the name of the school, you can do a search. It's very um, friendly, so you don't have to know the college code at all. Um, so you search by the name and the town, and it will give you several choices if appropriate. You click on that, and then the, the um, FAFSA will then ask the student are you going to live on campus or off campus? So that goes at the end of the FAFSA. That's it, we're done. <laughs> now, I mentioned the DRT, it's called the data retrieval tool. It is where the FAFSA will take you out of FAFSA pages into over into the IRS data retrieval. And um, you put in an identifier and this is gonna be more typical for the parents this year because most students probably did not file a tax return in 2019. But it will ask um, for some identifiers and then it will present your tax return information and it will say, do you want to bring this over? And I strongly recommend that you say yes, if you can, because if the um, FAFSA is selected for verification by the federal processor, you do not have to provide tax information. For that, you would have to fill out some other forms. The reason for that is because we know the information coming from IRS is accurate and it will populate the fields appropriately, not all of them, but most of the income ones. And then those answers are cloaked. So for your security, you can't see them, your child can't see them, we can see them at the college. And because you've used the DRT and they are cloaked, you cannot correct them. But if it's coming from IRS, we know it's accurate. So um, when we talk about unusual circumstances later, the college can always make a change. But what we're trying to do is eliminate the amount of paperwork that the family has to provide um, to the college in order to get their student a financial aid package. Now, this is probably the most important slide of the evening. When we're looking, and I want to be very clear on this, we have old info, current info, and projected info. So when you're looking at the income information, we're using old data, 2019 tax return. That's the year that we are looking at um, 
for your students starting next September. In terms of the amounts that you and your student are gonna list for savings, investments, stocks, bonds, money markets, you would put the amount as of the day you're signing the FAFSA or filling out the FAFSA. Because we know that things change and that you may have interest on your tax return from 2019 that indicates that there's a large savings account or a large investments, but maybe that source is gone. So you use the money to put an older child through a year of college or to buy a car or to, um, um, you got rid of an investment property. So we want to know as of the date of the application, what are the savings and investments? And this includes everything for both the student and the parents. So it's um, cash savings, although cash, we're not coming to look under your mattress or in your dresser drawers. Cash savings, um, checking accounts, money markets, CDs, stocks, bonds, mutual funds, investment property. Anything that is not in a retirement fund has to be listed on the FAFSA. And then the projection is for family size. So remember it, um, earlier I said the FAFSA is gonna collect household size and number in college. It's the household size that you anticipate for the school year that is still to come. So if you have um, two children, one going to college and two parents, it's a family of four with one in school. If you think that you're going to end up moving your elderly mother into your household over the summer, then you should project that there will be five in the family because that person is going to be in that household for this, the year that the student is in school. Does that make sense to everybody? I know it's hard, but it's old, old data, current data and projected data. Now, I think there's probably a question based on something that I said. So if the child has stocks and bonds in their own name, they would be listed as an asset under the child's name. We do not look at 401ks, 403bs, IRAs. There's the pension, the amount in the pension plan is protected. The amount that you have contributed this year in 2019 would be considered um, on the FAFSA and there's a separate line item for that. We do not look at um, mortgage on a primary loan. We don't care about your primary home. That has been off the FAFSA for years. Um, the, if we do want to see property, it's because you have a two family home and the half that you don't live in is an investment or you have a second home down at the shore or you have a building that you own and rent to somebody that's considered investment. So we would want to know the current market value and um, you take the current market value minus whatever you still owe on it. And that is what you would list as um, the value of that investment. Okay. Now, if you get a settlement from a retirement fund or a divorce settlement, you list it if you have received it. So again, it's as of the day the application is being filled out. So if you can defer a settlement until after the FAFSA is filed, that's great. And then it would show up uh, potentially next year if you still have those funds available to you. And then from Pamela, yes, if your parents move into your household and you are providing more than half support, then it would increase the household size by two. The key there is that you have to be providing more than half support and their information, their income would not be part of the deal. They are not, their um, information would not be on the tax return. Be aware that if you have your parents living with you, elderly parents living with you, and they're receiving social security, that's considered their income and that may mean you're not providing half support. Clear as mud. That's the way financial aid is. Okay, now common mistakes. Students name is often wrong. They use their nickname. They don't put their full last name. Uh, some of our students don't realize when they're born so or they transpose the date of birth. None of the students that are filling out this FAFSA with you have received a bachelor's degree at this point. 
and we get those and it makes the student eligible for much less funding. So when the, you get to the question of, will you have received a bachelor's degree by July 1st in 2021? The answer is no. Um, you can't skip the gender question, you have to answer it. Again, we already talked about parent and student sections. So make sure you're watching that banner up at the top. You don't want to duplicate income um, from the parent on the student side because that inflates the um, family contribution. Parents' marital status. So as of the day the student is filling out the application, what are the parent, what is the parent's marital status? If the parents are married, mom and dad are married, then they're married. If they, if mom and dad are not married but living together, they are not married but living together. If the parent is divorced, they should indicate that. If the parent who is divorced is now remarried, they are married. And the new spouse's information must be included on the FAFSA, regardless of whether there's any agreement that that new spouse, step parent, is going to pay anything toward your child's education. The, the reason that we ask for that information or the FAFSA asks for that information is because the government is looking at the financial strength of the household. And if there are two parents, even if one is a step parent, and there are two wages, then that family has more financial strength than potentially a family with just one parent. So remarried people are considered married and we do need to get the information from the, from the uh, step parent. Number in the household, people mess up all the time. If you have an older child who's enrolled in college, you're still basically providing more than half of their support, even if they're away at school. So don't forget to include them. Um, if you use the DRT, taxes paid versus taxes withheld is not an issue. But if you're filling this out by yourself, we want to know how much did IRS keep in taxes. It will not be the same as the income, which we get a lot. And it is not necessarily what was withheld. So you do have to pull out the tax return and use that information there. And then parent and student assets. Again, don't duplicate, um, but you have to answer the question. And I will also say zero is an answer. So if the answer is zero, put that down because at least then we know you answered the question and didn't just skip over it. Once you get through the FAFSA, which would take 30 to 45 minutes, um, if you are um, breezing through it and you're both sitting together, you can start the FAFSA, save it, and then go back later. But once you get to the end of the FAFSA and you put in the colleges and then you electronically sign the form, both the student and the parent will do that, then you get this page. And this says New York here, but it looks the same for New Jersey. It's the confirmation page, it says congratulations. And you could then go directly over on the link because it would say New Jersey here. And these slides are from the HESA. So I don't know why it says New York. Um, you can click on this and then your student can actually set up their profile at NJ FAMS right away. So this is why I say you have to write things down. Now we have a login and password for the FAFSA. We have a for the student and one for the parent. Now the student has to set up their portal in FAM. So that's another login and password. And then they're gonna end up with one for the college, maybe more than one, depending. So it can be very hard um, to keep track of all of this, particularly if you're applying to um, six or eight or 10 colleges. So write it down, put it in a safe place. I know you're not supposed to write anything down, but um, this is the, that's the only way to check. If the student doesn't, if you and the student don't link over to New Jersey on this page, that's not a problem. You wait a couple of days and then you can go directly into the NJ FAMS uh, website and, and the student can set up their portal there. Okay. This is what NJ FAMS looks like once the student accesses that information. And if the state is asking for additional information from the family, they would see it here in their to-do list. But this is also where the student can um, look at their eligibility and their award information. They will be getting emails from HESA, but they can check those here. They can update their um, contact information and they can set up their profile. It's a lot better than it used to be.
Now, I mentioned dreamers a while back. If you have a student who is a dreamer or undocumented or um, part of the DACA program, they cannot fill out a FAFSA because they don't have a valid social security number. So they should go directly to the HESA website and fill out the alternative application. It is identical to the FAFSA. It asks the same information, but they um, don't have to access the FAFSA itself. These are the criteria on the screen for a student who would meet eligibility for the alternative application as an undocumented student. We're not talking about the parents status, we're talking about the student here. Um, and the only complication to this slide is that if your student is applying to Rutgers, Rutgers requires a FAFSA because their system is so old that they cannot um, pull in uh, data from the alternative application. So you may end up doing both. Um, and I, unfortunately, that's the, the hard part, but um, that's one of the disadvantages of applying to Rutgers. Okay, I got my plug in. <laughs> okay, before we do this, let's um, see what kinds of questions we have. So, Again, we don't consider debt on a home equity loan or a mortgage on your primary home because your primary home is not part of the formula. If you have a property that has a mortgage, a second property, let's say it's, um, let's say it's a home down at the shore, you would calculate current market value based on what's going on in the neighborhood minus whatever you still owe on the property, and that would be the value you put down on the FAFSA. So if you have a $500,000 home and you still owe $400,000, the value of that property would be 100,000, okay? Next question. What if a divorced parent shares a household with someone but not married? They are considered divorced and unless, and this happens, so bear with me, unless they don't include the, the, the friend, okay? So if, the, if mom or dad has a friend who's living in the same household with the, with the parent and the student, that friend's information does not get included anywhere, including in the household size, they don't count. We do have situations where we have had a couple divorce and then they end up moving back in together. So even if that parent is divorced, if it is um, the student's um, mom and dad, and they are now living together, even though they're divorced, now they're considered not married, but living together. So they can't use divorce. Um, next question. Yes, students can go add additional colleges to the FAFSA. So you can put 10 on the first go round. Um, students may not have applied for admission yet. So if you're looking at 10 or 15 schools, put in the first 10. And then once the FAFSA gets processed, which is roughly 48 hours or so, the student can go back into the FAFSA as a correction, take out the first 10 schools, and then add five more. So, and there's no charge for that. This is all free. And they can do that many, many times. Um, and again, you don't have to have applied for admission to fill out the FAFSA. List all the schools you're thinking about make sure at least one is a New Jersey school. So the information does go over to HESA for state eligibility. And then you can go in and, and update and add more schools. Um, let me go back to this one here. If the money from a home equity loan is living in our savings account, do we subtract that? No, no, it's in your account. You haven't spent it. Again, we want to know the value of your cash savings, checking accounts, et cetera, et cetera, as of the day of the application. So if you have money there, go take it out tomorrow and then fill out your FAFSA on Saturday. You would submit the FAFSA each year. Yes, the tax year will change each year, it rolls forward. So for your student's second year in college, it will be the 2020 tax return and so forth and so on. Um, and um, for the last question, um, again, no, the, um, the login and password that you as a parent has to sign the FAFSA does not have to be different for each child. Each child has to have a different login and password. 
Okay. All right. So let's go back here. So now these are three, we have our own language. It's a whole new world. Um, financial aid has a lot of terminology. There are um, many terms that you'll become accustomed to, but these are the three key terms. And of course, everything's an acronym because that's the way we do it. So the EFC is an estimated family contribution. That is what spits out as a result of filing the FAFSA. You put all the numbers in, all the data, it gets crunched up. And then when the student gets their student aid report emailed to them, they can see what their estimated family contribution is. That um, in the beginning of financial aid used to be fairly accurate in terms of what families had available to help with the child's education. It is now considered more of a rationing tool to evaluate families with very low income or no income all the way up to the highest incomes. And it puts us, puts everybody on the same um, line in different places depending on the results. And that's what we use to determine aid eligibility, which you'll see on the next slide. Cost of attendance or COA is also sometimes called the budget. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. And then the third key term that you are going to learn today is need. And need is what colleges use to develop a financial aid package. And we'll talk about how that plays into all of this in a minute. So again, the estimated family contribution is produced by the formula. Um, it may or may not reflect what you can afford, but it is a ration tool for us to say, okay, family A has less income. They are less able to provide for the college education versus family B who has more income and assets. And so they are better equipped to help pay for the bill. Again, this includes all the information on the form and does account for parents and students income and assets. Um, the College Board has a calculator out there that you can use, but at this point, the FAFSA is available. You might as well fill it out and get an official answer and, um, and see what they say based on the actual application. Cost of attendance is developed by each school. And this is our way of trying to tell a family how much it's going to cost you to send your child to our institution for one year, nine months. The cost of attendance includes both direct and indirect expenses, some of which you will pay to the college and some of which will come out of your normal operating budget and you may not even notice on a regular basis. But we get to include them all in our cost because there is a cost to sending your child to college, even if you are paying for things like transportation. So tuition and fees is a direct expense. You will be billed for that. The child will be billed for that. Um, based on their registration. And typically you will see a bill for fall before classes start. And you'll see the bill for spring shortly after uh, registration for spring courses, which is typically in the fall. And the bill comes out in January. If a student is living on campus, we also include an amount for housing and meals or room and board. So that's a direct expense if they're living on campus and it will be included on the bill from student accounts or the bursar. If a student is living at home and commuting, we still get to put that into the cost of attendance because it's costing you something to house and feed your child, but it's an indirect expense. So you're not going to get a bill from the college. You're going to just absorb that in your everyday um, expenditures. Books and supplies are for most schools, a direct expense, but it is not included on the bill. Now, if your child goes to um, a vocational program, um, for example, electrician, HVAC, CAD CAM, um, automotive, they may include books and supplies as part of the charges that are paid to the college, but most um, traditional four-year programs do not. The student can go to the bookstore and buy books. The student can go online and buy books, um, Amazon, the student can go online and rent books. Um, Amazon, Chegg, C-H-E-G-G, -G, uh, Book Renter. There are very few students, particularly the first two years that really want to keep their books. You're talking about your gen ed requirements, math, science, history, um, and books are very expensive. You can buy new, you can buy used, you can rent. 
And when the student rents a book, they fill out the start and end date for the semester. And typically they get a mailer from the book company and they have to return it within two weeks of finals. And it's a much less expensive way to do that. Transportation is an indirect expense. You're either paying for that now to get your child into their car and helping with gas, or you're going to do that. Um, you, you will not get a, that on the bill. That will be um, something that comes out of your monthly expenditures. And miscellaneous expenses includes the weekend money, the book money, um, no, not the book, weekend money, pizza money, laundry money. These are things that are not part of um, what you're being billed, but we get to include them. And the goal for the college is to accurately reflect how much it's going to cost for you to send your child to our institution, but also to give you an idea of, of what these expenses are so that you can plan. Financial aid, the FAFSA is for an academic year, which is fall and spring. And then everything is split into two semesters or three semesters if you're at a trimester program or four quarters. And so billing and registration and billing happens for each term. Um, so it gets split out over the course of the year. And the last term is need. So in order for us to determine your financial aid, the financial aid eligibility for the student, we have to take the cost of attendance that we've developed. We take the EFC from the FAFSA and that gives us the student's need. So let's see what that looks like. These are fairly decent, accurate prices for New Jersey. So if you have um, a child who's planning to go to community college right now, it's for the first year, approximately $6,000 cost of attendance. And we're not naming names, but that, you know, I, most of the community colleges are very inexpensive. Um, if the family's EFC is 11,000, you can see that there's no need because the EFC exceeds the cost for the year. At a four-year public, we can say, okay, let's say this cost is $25,000 for the year, that's two semesters. The EFC does not change, it is still 11,000. And now we have some need for the student. Now, this is not grant territory. Um, there's no tuition grant, aid grant from New Jersey or Pell from the federal government based on that EFC, but the student would be eligible for subsidized loan funds and would be eligible for institutional grant-based aid if there is any. And at a four-year private where tuition, is, um, tuition fees are much more expensive, so let's say that that's 45,000, we apply the same EFC and the need goes up to 34,000. And this EFC is the same for one academic year, regardless of what school the student goes to. Okay. Now, let me see what we've got here. So let's just make sure I'm not skipping any questions. Okay, yes, the FAFSA has to be submitted every year um, if you choose to do so. My recommendation is that you file the FAFSA for freshman year for your student and get an answer. And with that information, um, if there's not fluctuation on income information every year, it's going to be the same similar results for each subsequent year. And if you're deciding that there's no grant funding available and you're not going to have the student borrow student loans, you don't need a parent plus loan, you don't ever have to file again. Um, there's not really any advantage to filing the FAFSA before, I mean, um, submit the FAFSA before our school choice is priority deadline. You, you want to make sure you meet the priority deadline for the financial aid at each college so that you can be considered, your child can be considered for the maximum amount of funding. So if you, as I said earlier, if you have a school, one school has a, a January one priority deadline and another school has February one, file the FAFSA before January 1st so that you can be um, within that priority group and you've made everybody else's priority deadline if they're after the fact. Okay. Now, we talked about four types of aid, grants, scholarships, loans, and work. We talked about four sources of aid, 
federal, state, institutional, and private. And now we're gonna talk about um, which programs fall under what category. So the federal programs include Pell, SEOG, which is short for Supplemental Educational Opportunity Grant. That is a program where the college receives an allocation or an allowance, and then we make the funding decision based on the federal criteria. So that's additional grant funding to um, the neediest students. Federal work study, if a student is federal work study eligible and they get a job on campus, the money to pay that student's paycheck actually comes from the federal government. And these two sources of aid tend to run out fairly quickly, which is why you wanna make that priority deadline. The staff for direct student loans are loans the student would borrow in their own name and pay them back once they finish college. The TEACH grant is for students who want to teach in a highly needy area, geographic area, or a highly needy subject. A lot of colleges do not give TEACH grants to underclassmen because we understand that 18 year olds often aren't sure what they wanna do and may not be ready to make a um, five to 10 year commitment to working in um, a district that is uh, disadvantaged or teaching um, a particular subject. So what happens is this tends to be more for upperclassmen and graduate students. And in financial aid, we call it a groan because it starts as a grant, but if a student doesn't fulfill their commitment for that teaching requirement, it turns into um, a loan automatically with back interest calculated. So we don't like, it's not our favorite program. <clears throat> and the last federal program is the Parent PLUS loan. You can borrow because you have a undergraduate student and the Parent PLUS loan um, has a credit review, but it is not a full-blown credit check. Um, and this is money available from the federal government that is um, to help the student and to, to help you pay uh, for their bill. The state of New Jersey programs include TAG, which is the large grant program available at each school. The amounts may differ depending on which type of school your student's going to. So for example, a TAG grant at a community college will be smaller in dollars than at a four-year public because the tuition is less and it's less expensive. Educational Opportunity Fund is a program in New Jersey that helps students from specific um, school districts who um, have a um, opportunity to to go to college. And that program does provide some grant funding, but also a lot of support to the student, including counseling and tutoring um, and um, help with homework and, and their um, educational requirements in the classroom. New Jersey STARS and STARS II is a program for students who meet certain criteria. STARS is at the community college level. Student has to have a specific GPA coming out of high school. They have to maintain that. And then once they finish two years of community college, they can roll into a four-year public in Jersey and receive STARS too. Governor's Urban Scholarship is um, a scholarship for specific schools um, or students from specific areas. And those um, nominees are submitted by the guidance office to HESA. Um, and that usually happens in the spring of the senior year. Free tuition under the CCOG program still exists even under the pandemic. Um, and for families that meet the income criteria, the student would um, use their Pell grant and their tuition aid grant. And if there is still an outstanding balance, then they would be eligible for CCOG funds. New Jersey Gives is um, a scholarship that is designed to um, help women and minorities who are going to a vocational program or an industrial program at specific schools. And then NJ Class is a private loan offered by the state of New Jersey, which is subsidized by bond structures. So that is a loan product. Institutions often have their own programs too, and they typically fall into need-based, merit-based, and skills-based. We did talk about merit and skills before. This varies drastically from school to school and depends on how much funding the college has in, its, in their own coffers, what kind of foundation um, program they have, the donors that are giving to the school. 
So this information would be available on the website for each college. Um, and if you just type in scholarship programs or um, merit aid, you would get that kind of information. Okay. There are other ways to help a family pay the bill. Most schools do offer a payment plan. Um, typically it's a minimum of three payments and can be as many as five, depending on the schools. Usually there's a nominal fee to enroll in the program. Um, there's typically no interest charge on this because you are making the arrangement with the college that you will pay over time. The advantage to a payment plan is that you can spread out the balance of the bill. So if you have a bill for the fall semester, let's just say it's 15,000 and the student uh, has received $5,000 in aid, that balance of 10,000 can be put on a payment plan and then it helps split it up for several months over the course of the semester. So it's a cash flow um, assist for families. And there are some families that that's all of the additional assistance they need just to spread it out rather than pay a $10,000 bill in August. They would pay um, one third or one fifth of that for several months going forward. <clears throat> um, there are also private loans available. They come from various lenders. Um, I'm sure most people have heard of Sally May. We just received notice Wells Fargo was getting out of the loan programs. Um, but you can look at college websites and see a list of the lenders that might be um, working with that school. The interest rates and repayment options vary based on the credit check of the borrower. And this has a full credit check. The advantage to a private loan is that anybody can borrow as long as they're credit worthy or they have a credit worthy co-signer. So this could be mom or dad, could be aunt or uncle, could be grandma. It could be the student themselves with a credit worthy co-signer. So private loans have that advantage. My only advice on that is go for the lowest interest rate so that you're paying the least amount possible over the life of the loan. And finally, 529s, if you have a 529 plan set up for your student, you can use that to help pay the bill. Typically they need to see a bill from the college and then they send money over to the institution as a payment. 529 plans are also an oddball thing when you're filling out the FAFSA. If you are the parent and you have a 529 plan for your student, that's considered an asset. You have to report the value of that 529 plan. If you have four 529 plans set up for your four children, you must report the total of all of them as an asset on the FAFSA for the student who's uh, applying to college. If the student owns a 529 plan in their own name, which is very rare for 16 year olds or 17 year olds to have, it gets reported, the value of the 529 gets reported on the parent's side as an asset. So, and the advantage to that is because assets of the student they take a bigger contribution from, for the um, student from the student assets. Parents, it's a much lower percentage. So for a student who has significant assets, approximately 30% will be part of the estimated family contribution available for the educational expenses. For a parent, the maximum percentage that is contributed from your assets would be 12. And depending on the age of the older parent, it can be less. So now when we do what we do in our office, whether it's us by hand or the machinery that we have, the uh, programming that we have, we are trying to distribute limited resources to as many students as possible based on the results of the FAFSA. And it's called a package, financial aid packaging. Um, we're adding little bits and pieces and trying to develop a combination that covers as much of the expense to the student as possible. Um, most colleges cannot meet full need. We do focus on the build cost as much as possible. And we're trying, typically trying to close the gap between um, the financial aid and um, the direct expenses knowing that the indirect expenses like transportation and maintenance costs um, can be covered by the family. There, 
a couple of years ago, there was um, a list circulating of about 100 schools that claim to meet full need. I would think um, as a result of the pandemic, that number is going to go down. Um, it's very rare for a college to be able to have that kind of resources available to them. But there are some, there are some. Typically, and every school does this differently, but typically you'll see that grants are listed first. Anything that's a grant or scholarship um, or entitlement or formula driven, um, that's the money that doesn't have to be paid back. So that's the most favorable. And then we often will then um, calculate <clears throat> eligibility for the, um, the work study and SEOG, which are allocations to the colleges that run out. So that's why that priority deadline is important. Student loans are almost always included in the package because the student can borrow without any credit check. Um, they just have to be enrolled at least half time. And then institutional aid usually comes in at the bottom. Some colleges will include the Parent PLUS loan in their packaging, but um, a lot of us believe that because it's not guaranteed to be received by the parent if they can't pass the credit review, um, so we don't include it. And loans are always optional. Even when we throw um, student loans up onto a financial aid package, a um, student always has the option to decline that. Okay, let me, I see a couple questions here. So let's see what we've got going on here. Okay, so the question is, is this only for 529 plans? And I'm assuming that um, you're asking the question that if it's owned by the student and it's reported on the parent side, is it only for that? Yes, anything else that is in the student's name is considered an asset on the student side. And then um, institutional aid could be merit scholarship or it could be need-based, it could be both. So for example, at a place like ours, the um, presidential scholarship is a merit-based scholarship um, that the admissions office determines based on high school achievement. Um, in our office, we have some funding and we use that for resident grants to help reduce the cost of living on campus. And that for us at Montclair is need-based. So the student has to fit within certain parameters. Um, EFC has to be below X and the income is below Y. We um, set those up every year. Okay. Okay, we're moving along. <clears throat> so verification is a term we use and it describes a process that financial aid offices require some families to go through based on the random selection by the FAFSA processor. So when the FAFSA is submitted and it runs through all of the data checks and it runs through the formula, there is a random selection of FAFSAs based on the data provided that indicate the student must complete verification with, with the college. If you use the DRT, it does lessen your chances of being selected for verification. And I will tell you that the majority of files selected for verification are those that are lower income families that have um, Pell eligibility, so eligibility for the federal grant. And the goal of verification is for us to check to make sure that what was reported on the FAFSA is accurate. Again, if you can use the DRT, it, it can not only eliminate your chances for verification, but if you are, if the FAFSA is selected for verification, it reduces the amount of paperwork you have to submit. So if the FAFSA is selected for verification, that's federal verification and everything will be on um, the school side so the school will send emails. You'll get a message right on the student aid report, but the school will send emails on a regular basis to the student. The information will be available in a school portal and all the documents from the family have to go directly to the school. We have the fiduciary responsibility to ensure that the funds go to the right students. Um, and so we are responsible for completing the verification process with each family. If the federal government doesn't select this file for verification and the state of New Jersey does, then everything will be listed in NJ FAMS and everything has to go to HESA directly. It does not come to the college at all. <clears throat> and 
And there is a deadline for the submission of documents when we're talking about state aid. So if you um, are working with a student who was selected for state verification and they see that on their NJFAMs under their tasks, just be very conscious of the fact that if anything is submitted after November 1st, then the student has lost out on grant eligibility for the whole year. So we wanna make sure that the best thing to do is file the FAFSA early, get the results. When you start receiving emails from the college or from HESA, you start responding to those emails. Don't wait until August because in August, the turnaround time is much more delayed because everybody waited. If you start submitting in April and May, then your processing is going to be much smoother. Okay. Now, when we determine what aid the student is eligible for, we produce what's called um, a financial aid award notice or award letter or award notification. The format will vary based on the school. It's um, more and more schools are going online with this and not sending hard copy to the family. But um, in a lot of cases, if it's online, you can print it out and take a look and read it there. And when the student is going to receive this notification is based on the college parameters. So we can't do anything till the FAFSA is filed. Most colleges will not look at a student's FAFSA until they've been accepted by the college. Um, at Montclair, we get 40 or 50,000 FAFSAs every year, and we probably get 10 or 12,000 app applications. And if we accept seven or 8,000, those are the students we want to focus on. Otherwise, we'd never be able to go home. When you do get the notification or when your student gets the notification, the thing to look at is um, grants versus loans. Compare apples to apples and make sure that you understand what is being offered to the student. And we'll talk about how that can um, get complicated depending on what you're looking at. So you want to look at direct expenses only, tuition and fees. Let's just assume there's no on-campus housing. Tuition and fees, and then take all the grant aid off. And that will give you a net balance. Now, is that affordable to the family? If not, then take that net balance and subtract the student loans because student loans are a viable option. And does that then make the balance more affordable? You have to look at the bottom line, what is going to come out of your pocket, and you have to compare apples to apples. Um, and it is true that a more expensive school can actually cost the family less because some of those private schools, particularly the big name ones, Harvard, Yale, Princeton, um, uh, Boston College, Boston U, they have a lot of foundation money and scholarship money that they give to students. Some of it's need-based, some of it's merit-based. So they are looking to try and reduce the amount of money that you have to pay and try and equalize with the, pro with the public schools. So again, apples to apples, do the math, and we'll give you the math too, and I'll show you that in a minute, but you want to make sure that you're looking at the bottom line, what is not being covered by the college through the aid programs. So there are several resources you can use to help you make decisions about whether you can afford a particular school or not. Every college is required to have a net price calculator on their website. And that gives you an estimate of what the net price is for that school based on their financial aid population and their merit receiving population. The best tool you have is what we call the shopping sheet or the, financi the financing plan. Um, more and more schools are going to this because there is a requirement, um, particularly in New Jersey, to present information this way. So what happens is we will put out to the student all of this information. It's very pretty, it's interactive. Um, we tr it gets laid out in a way that should be easier to understand than everything just um, bunched together. We're representing one year's worth of costs. It gives you all of the aid options. So grants first, so you can see like here is cost for the year. And we'll list tuition fees, we'll list room and board. 
Here are the grants and scholarships being offered to the student and then there's a net cost. So we've done the math. Then we put loan information under that. And again, um, most schools you're going to see the student loans, not necessarily the um, parent loan. And that then gives you a new net cost. We also include other information on this um, financing sheet, including the default rate at the college that how many students are not paying back their loans once they get out of school, graduation rates, median debt. And it all gets boiled down so that we're trying to give you information right in your hands so that you know, here's my cost, here's my grants, here are my loans, here's the bottom line what that we have to pay out of pocket. It's a very useful tool. Um, it's, it's actually fairly well designed. Every school may present it slightly differently, but um, this is the kind of information you want to look at. And you wanna lay them all out side by side to make sure that you're looking at the same information for each college. I mentioned that I would throw up some websites that are helpful. This is HESA's website, um, Planning for College. There's a lot of information that the state offers. Anybody can go in and look at any time. FinAid.org is a, um, um, independent website that is actually developed and run by um, a gentleman who's like a financial aid wonk. Um, and he follows regulation. He updates this regularly. College Board uh, has their own website. And these two um, also have scholarship search engines right on them so that you can go and look at legitimate scholarships. You can also check the uh, scholarship pages on each website, um, each college website. Um, there are um, a lot of scholarships out there that may not be credible. So if a scholarship is asking for a student social security number and or a payment, I would run the other way. Um, go to the college website, at least type in scholarship and see what they have because we vet anything that we put up on our website as legitimate. Mapping Your Future is an organization that will give you the same kind of information. This is all of this, there is so much out there. But if you want to do things piecemeal, which is the only way to really learn financial aid a little bit at a time, go out, look at one website and then type in whatever you're searching for or go to the college website and say, okay, today I wanna to learn about Montclair's loans. So I'm gonna to go to Montclair and I'll type in loans and see what they say. You cannot go through a website about financial aid in one sitting. You do have to break it up. Your guidance office also has a lot of information. I know Mr. Fitzgerald mentioned that he was he had forwarded information from HESA, uh, various um, help brochures and flyers. Um, again, there's a lot of information out there. The best places to go would be to go to HESA one of these or the colleges themselves, because at least you know then that um, it's vetted and it's legitimate. Okay, let me stop for a second and see what we have in the chat. Okay, I think we're, in, we're up to date with answering. Okay. Now, um, parents typically ask, can I appeal the financial aid? And that's a decision that you have to make based on what you're seeking to do. So um, we get a lot of appeals from students and they think that we can just reduce their tuition. We can't do that. The, the board of trustees at every school sets tuition um, every year and it is what it is. If you are planning to appeal, there has to be a reason for that. So if you're looking at the need-based aid that was offered to the student and you're saying, well, there's not enough need-based aid, you would have to present a valid argument as to why your um, why your financial why the financial aid for the student is not sufficient, and we'll talk about it a little more. But for example, has there been a change in circumstances in the family that is now making it harder to pay your bill? So that would be legitimate. You would have to be prepared to present information. If you're appealing merit-based aid. I will tell you that most colleges will look at information that you have um, from the student that may have changed. So for example, um, this, your son is offered a $10,000 merit scholarship based on um, the first three years of high school. And his senior year after um, 
the ha first half of the year has done incredibly well and has really brought his GPA even higher. That would be a legitimate reason to go to the college and say, I understand that we have the merit, we appreciate it, thank you, please be nice. But um, we've actually seen better scores come through, the grades have gone up, is there anything that you can do? I will also tell you that if you have three private colleges and a public, um, the public school doesn't care that you were offered $30,000 by the private school because the public school probably still costs less than what you're paying out of pocket. So we may ask you to send us the, the uh, award notifications from the other schools so that we can look at and compare. If you're getting $30,000 on a cost of attendance that, or, or tuition and fees that's 50,000 and the public school, the tuition fees is only 20,000, right there, you've got an imbalance. And it could be that there's no more funds available or you're not making your case because the private school is trying to equalize to entice you to send your child to them. So I, I would say email or send a letter, um, be polite, don't try to negotiate. Um, we often have parents say, well, I'll send my child elsewhere. Okay, fine. You have to make the decision which college your student is going to um, attend based on the programs offered, the, um, the activities, the life that that college is going to present to your student, and then your cost. So it's a combination of many things. Couple things to consider as you're kind of looking through um, websites. Um, if a student has scholarship money and they're offered a scholarship, you need to be aware of how that is renewable. Is there a minimum GPA at the college that the student has to meet? That's pretty typical. Um, if it's need-based aid, a lot of colleges do try to respect um, the similar amounts from year to year. But if your income swings significantly upward, it may change the aid that the student is receiving based on the results of the uh, FAFSA calculation. You should also be aware of what colleges do with outside scholarships. So if your son or daughter has obtained three outside scholarships for a total of $5,000, that's wonderful. It reduces how much you have to pay out of pocket. But what does the college do with that? Do they take away their money or do they reduce the loans? Um, every school does it differently. Of course, the goal in most of our minds is to reduce borrowing and reduce indebtedness. So um, many schools reduce loans first, um, but some schools will take back their own money. Be aware of scholarship scams. Again, don't provide social security numbers, don't pay money. You don't have to do that. Your choice to hire a consultant. Uh, I, would, I would do the FAFSA on your own. We get more errors on FAFSAs completed by accountants or consultants. Um, your consultant, if you hire a consultant, it's buyer beware, make sure you are getting something for it. If you go to somebody and they say, well, I can, I can tell you about five financial aid programs. Well, I've told you about more than that. So you already know that information. Consultants may be um, more useful in terms of planning ahead. So what are your finances looking like now? And then what's going to happen over three or four years? Um, there are um, good consultants out there that help students and families fill out applications for admission. But I can tell you admissions counselors read those essays and they can tell if a parent has written it as opposed to the student. Um, has a lot to do with punctuation and font and uh, size and margins. It's amazing. Um, so we really, you know, the college wants to see the student. They want to get a, a feel for who the student is. Um, Review the um, award notifications carefully so that, again, you're comparing apples to apples. I know I mentioned briefly before, so in a little more detail, if there has been a significant change in income for various reasons, retirement, unemployment, company closing, and this year, of course, we're seeing hundreds of families impacted by the pandemic, and there is a significant in change in income. Colleges have the ability to review the more current information as opposed to going back to tax years. You have to 
check the websites and see what their process is. Some have online forms, some have a form you print out and submit paper. We do require additional documentation. Um, for example, if somebody's unemployed, typically colleges are gonna want tax return, um, most recent pay stub or last pay stub, the unemployment benefit statement, um, information about the other uh, parent earnings. And what we are trying to do is maximize aid based on the fact that there's been a change in income, a negative change in income, and try and increase some federal and state grant funding. And some schools will increase their own institutional aid depending on how much they have available to, to them. Every school does these differently. Um, and you may get two different answers from different, two different schools because we set the parameters. There's a lot of leeway within the regulation. We have one regulation that says we can do this. It doesn't tell us how. Um, documentation is key. And we can process these for federal grant funds as well as state grant funds. We're a little more limited on the New Jersey side because they only accept six conditions, whereas the federal government, we can be creative and look at more things than just those six. But if you um, have, because we're looking at 2019 information, you may be in a position where you've had a significant change in income the best thing to do is to check the website on the college financial aid page about special circumstances, extenuating circumstances, whatever um, uh, appeals is another key term and see how the college will accept information and when they will process those. The general timeline for all of this is to try and coordinate this with admissions applications too. So now, um, depending on what schools you're looking at, you may have completed the search. You may know what schools um, your son or daughter is applying to. Now's the time to apply for the admissions process. Get the FAFSA done. We may not look at it at the college until the students accept it, but that's fine. Get it done, get it out of the way. If a college requires profile, fill that out um, and get that submitted. Between December and April, um, students are notified that they're accepted. Some colleges are actually starting that earlier. Um, and aid offers begin to be sent to students. Students have to be on top of their college portals because they need to make sure that they've submitted documentation that is required. And then once a student goes through the orientation process and registers for classes, bills are generated. And that is usually um, in the summer, June, July, and August. Bills are always wanted, um, they always have a due date before classes start in August. So you wanna make sure that you have the financial aid process completed so that everything is lined up even before that bill is generated, but certainly before August. As I said, students who respond early in the year actually have the advantage because they get finished and their information is accurate. And then when that bill hits the account, um, there's nothing, there's no rush to submit information. Um, I can tell you that the state of New Jersey state verification process right now, they are on a five week delay because everybody waits to the last minute to submit forms. Um, depending on the college, it could be two to four weeks, even longer for a school to get through verification processes. So you don't wanna do that. It's, it's hard to manage until the student decides which school that they want to attend. But at that point, the minute they make the commitment and say, oh, I want to go to um, Joe Blow College, then that's the school you want to work with and make sure everything is set and complete and organized. And remember, this bill is not going to be mailed to you. There are very, school, very few schools that are mailing any kind of paper at this point. So that's why those um, college portals are important. The student would get an email and say, oh, you have a bill, you better go take a look and see what you're gonna do about it. Um, if you do everything early enough, then it gives you time to make decisions about more borrowing through the PLUS loan program or private loans and time for that processing because those can take some time too. And that's it. And I don't see any questions in the chat. If you have a question, I would invite you to submit those now. Um, I'm more than happy to answer. 
And here's my information. If you think of something overnight, which is when most of us do our processing, um, you can always email me at Montclair and just identify yourself as a parent that was at the, um, the Butler High School financial aid presentation. And I'd be happy to answer uh, your question that way too. Okay. I have a thank you. Thank you. I appreciate everybody's time. It's a lot of information, which is why um, we are um, making, if this recording is good, I will get it to the school and we'll make that available. And um, the material is already out there so that you should have access to it um, at any time on the, um,